Rule 6. Should any patron hear a strange growling noise from any arcade cabinet, let them know immediately that you'll take care of it, and get a kit from underneath the manager's desk and place it behind the game in question. This incident I'll tell you about happened nearly five months into the job. It happened about five or six times a month. Some kid was complaining about hearing a low growling from the Frogger machine. There are kits for each arcade underneath the manager's desk, supposedly containing different foods for different monsters inside the cabinets. They said that they heard the growling after they completed about five levels, and it distracted them so much that they ended up failing into a game over. Don't worry, kid. I'll take care of the problem. I rushed to the manager's office and asked if I could get something from beneath his desk. Rule six, Danforth, he asked. Yes, rule six. Which arcade? Frogger. Hang on. I waited for about half an hour outside the manager's office. I was bored, so I was about to leave when he came out with the necessary kit. Here, remember to place it directly under the arcade cabinet. I rushed over to the Frogger cabinet and quickly put the kit underneath the cabinet. Almost immediately, I thought I saw tentacles just kind of take the kit. I'll admit, it scared me so bad that I jumped and one of the kids asked if I was okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Thanks for your concern. Rule 7. If a strange woman's face suddenly shows up at the game where you throw balls at the bottles, close it off until the face is gone. I had the drive to follow this rule after I saw what happened when a patron actually played it when the face was present. The face looked a lot like Olivia Newton-Johns from that movie Grease. My getting distracted caused what happened next. I saw the guy start to play. He threw two balls without incident. The face showed up right after he threw the third one to topple the third set of plastic bottles. The ball hit the face, and if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I'd have never believed it. The face showed a lot of anger. It stuck its tongue out, then opened its mouth wide. The man could hardly believe his eyes. He looked scared. Luckily, no one else was near the game, which was good because no one else had to watch that face slide up out of the game and eat the man whole. I stood there in shock for a minute. I noted the identity of the patron and closed off the game. We do this by adding a sign and some yellow tape that says it's under repair. Then I went to the manager immediately. I told him everything. Danforth, that face tends to show up when you least expect it. It's very rare that the face would show up right as the game is being played. You were supposed to tell him to wait between throws in case the face showed up. I blinked. I, I did. He even complied. Okay. That face showed up just as he threw the ball. Mm-hmm. Meaning that either the timing was bad, or that thing's getting smarter. I'll look into the incident. For now, close the game off for the rest of the day. And that was just what I did. The face usually goes away after an hour of the game being closed, but it takes a little longer if it gets someone. Could be why he wanted me to close it off for the rest of the day, I guess. Rule number eight. If a brunette shows up in a black dress with a facial tattoo of a spider web and walks through as if she's floating, notify the manager immediately. This one happened about six months into the job. I was making my rounds after hours, making sure to keep following the rules. The patrons were just leaving when I saw the brunette walk in. It took me a while to notice her face. Yeah, she was wearing a black dress. She did walk like she was floating. She was super tall, as though she might be over eight feet. I was about to dismiss her as a patron coming for a prize when I noticed the unmistakable tattoo of a spider web around her right eye. After six months of noticing what happened when you break the rules, how could I not rush to the manager's office on instinct? Boss, we got a rule eight. I see. Bring her to me, Danforth. This might take a while, so just wait outside till I'm done. I had a strong feeling that he might have met her before. I looked all over for this girl. Yeah, she was beautiful. Yeah, she was tall, but for some reason she kind of blended in. I finally found her by the Pac-Man machine, and I took her straight to the manager's office. When I asked her to come with me, though, she turned around and she looked scared to death. I told her it was okay, and I brought her to the manager's office. The door closed as she went inside, and I just waited there until he was done. He was right, it certainly took a while. Boredom started setting in, and the arcade machines turning on and off, on and off, was getting annoying. After a while, the brunette walked out, seemingly calm, and left the arcade. The manager's eyes appeared bloodshot, and I asked him what had been going on. Can't tell you, but were the arcade screens acting strange? They were, they were turning on and off, over and over. He paused for a moment. He looked at the arcade screens and saw they were still doing it. Danforth? Yeah, boss. It's time. We have to break Rule 9 tomorrow. Rule 9. Do not play the nameless arcade game that randomly shows up in every corner of the arcade.
The cabinet in question has no name at all. Almost every day, it just randomly shows up in another corner. The arcade screens have different ways of acting if the brunette shows up, he told me. If they were showing weird images and cycling, it meant that there was nothing wrong. If they were showing the image of that girl while the brunette was there, then he had to let her talk to the brunette. But if they were flashing like that, like you know, they had the day before, then we'd have to break rule nine. The next day, the nameless arcade machine showed up near the entrance. It was almost like muscle memory for me to try to put the out of order sign on it, but the manager just waved me off. I need to do this to keep the business going and to protect everyone. I was looking over his shoulder, studying the game that I had so often ignored. A new name, Lester Harrison, showed up in the left corner, a name that turned out to be the manager, though I didn't know it at the time. The name of the game was No Heart, No Soul, just as it had been for the other kids who had died playing it. I heard that in this nameless arcade game, the avatar was consistent, unlike the Rule 1 cabinet. In it, the avatar looked like a rich man with a disfigured face, my boss got the man to the right of the arcade game, and the man talked to what appeared to be a zombified blend of a biker punk chick and the disguise that the two FBI characters wore in white chicks. They seemed to talk in an unintelligible language, a mix of Spanish and Irish, I think. Then the screen changed to black, with the white text that said, Please choose a new manager. Then the manager said, I already did. He's my best employee, and I think he's fit for the job. Then the text changed again. Danforth Crab. Indeed, he is eligible. Then, the game changed. It changed into the ones described in Rule 1. It changed into one of those EXE ones that we weren't supposed to play. The ones that had led to the death of those two kids. In this case, it was the Avatar in a burning version of Green Hill Zone of Sonic the Hedgehog. Then the manager went catatonic, his skin paler than I'd ever seen it. I decided to move his body off, and then the text read, Now that you have taken the managerial duties of this place, Please move the character to the goal. He would have wanted you to manage the arcade and protect everyone. When I did as it asked, I noticed the name on the corner changed into mine. So I played it to bring the avatar to the goal. I was scared, even when I managed to get it playing. Scared because the manager died right then and there, before the game had ever even been completed. I was mentally scarred by the experience of following and seeing the effects of breaking each rule, but I had to do it. It took a while, but... When I finally got him to the goal, I was relieved. Then the game's text switched again. You've passed the test. I assure you that you will do what you can to save us all. Remember to read the manuals on the desk so that you can fulfill your job. Goodbye. Then the arcade turned itself off. I went to Lester Harrison's office, now my office, I suppose, and looked into the manuals. I was scared because I'd never taken such a job before. Also, having witnessed his death, a death that was shared by Gabriel and Natalie, had scared me. The manual was leather-bound, had the rules, the reasons why, and instructions on how employees must be trained. On the last page, it said, Rule 10, the establishment must always have a manager and an owner. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. If you enjoyed tonight's story, don't forget to look down in the description to find the Nine-Tailed Tanuki and read some of their other stuff. They have a few other things, and they're pretty good. If you're not already subscribed, why not go ahead and subscribe to the channel? Hit that bell so you don't miss any of the spooky stuff we do here. We update every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so don't miss out on any of the great creepy fun we have here. While you're down in the description, why not go ahead and have a look at my latest book, Sleepless Nights. It's on sale on Amazon for $9.99, so go ahead and get your own copy. Let's go ahead and thank our patrons. Thanks to the Irish Devil and Janet for being our Spooky Skeleton tier contributors. Thanks to Emily Coltsfoot, Zoronan, and Leslie Lou Riddle for being our Ghost Reader tier contributors. And thanks to Glenn Jenkins for being our Ghost Rider tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do it without you. If you too would like to support the show, come on down to Patreon. For just $5 a month, you too can get your Spooky on a Tuesday and a Thursday, as well as having your name read out at the end of every TikTok and every YouTube video I do. I've also been randomly inserting the names of patrons into some of my stories, so if you're into that, come on down and be a patron. Become the focus of one of my spooky stories, and live on in infamy forever. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.